So again, my name is Mark Anderson. Uh, my talk today will be on real life DOE and specifically how to use graphical diagnostics to deal with bad experimental data. Uh, it might be bad or it might not be bad. I guess that's the question. Now, as my note says here, communication issues uh, to avoid disrupting the audio, we're muting all of the participants. Uh, I might unmute somebody from time to time or I might not. But meanwhile, uh, we have another individual, Brooks, on our questioning line so that if you enter a question uh, while I'm speaking, Brooks uh, will have a chance to try to give you a quick answer. Uh, and possibly he may come in and have me address a question to the group as a whole. Uh, it will be best, however, uh, if you would email uh, questions. And when you email, then email those to the STATIES, uh, the stathelp at stadies.com. So this is a general email address that I think a lot of people have probably used that can be very helpful with any question you might have about the design analysis of experiments or statistics in general. So with that, I'd like to begin uh, and talk about real-life DOE. Uh, I do want to say that uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about here is covered in the book DOE Simplified, which is uh, in the second edition. This was co-authored by myself and my partner here at Stadies, Pat Woodcomb. Uh, and so if you're interested in picking up on a lot of the details, then go to this DOE Simplified. Uh, recently, uh, I've taken the uh, first several chapters and converted them to a voiceover PowerPoint, which I call the web-based launchpad. And uh, I'll give you a brief demonstration of that. It's a free resource. Uh, you just need to email stathelpatstadies.com or email me directly, mark at stadies.com, and ask to uh, get the link to get into this uh, presentation. So for example, uh, I've got uh, some material on uh, simple comparative experiments. And these take the form of little movies. Uh, as an experiment on one of them, I put a little picture in picture, which you see here. And so this just gives you an idea of what it's all about. So uh, normally you'd be hearing the audio at this point. All right, so enough of that. Uh, so now you know there's some resources, the uh, book DOE Simplified, and then if you're interested in having a launch pad to help you get going through the first several chapters, we have that as well. Okay, the mission for this webinar is uh, while keeping things relatively simple, statistically, which I call the KISS principle, provide some tricks of the trade that salvage outstanding results from actual experiments. Uh, I did give this presentation some years ago for the American uh, Society of Quality at their World Congress. This is back, I think, in uh, 2002. Uh, I do have to warn you that there's a few mathematical functions coming because afterwards I got a complaint that uh, Mark had used uh, trigonometric functions, and not only had he just used a sine, but he also used an arc sine, but on top of that, he applied a square root, which just wasn't fair. So I'm managing expectations here that there will be a few uh, mathematical terms used, and of course, a number of statistical ones, but uh, hopefully I'll keep it simple for you. Now, as a little experiment, I haven't tried this before, but I thought I would try a quick survey uh, via a poll. And so what I'm going to do is pull up on the screen a poll, and that will show up on your screen. And I'm going to have you enter in your highest DOE ability uh, when this poll comes up. So let's go ahead, and I'm going to launch this poll to specify your DOE ability. So here we go. I've just launched it. All right. So on your screen, if you would click uh, 1, can you compute an average? I hope so. 2, this would separate people that can make a simple comparison via t-test. Three would be the next level up, uh, screening, characterizing process factors via two-level design. Four starts to really get to the advanced levels of optimizing process via response methods. And then five is probably the ultimate, even applied statisticians sometimes have a little trouble with this because it's finding the sweet spot in a recipe or formulation via mixture design. For me, this is kind of a natural being a chemical engineer, but uh, for a lot of people, this is very, very difficult. So these are five levels of expertise at DOE that I thought I would uh, see if uh, see what kind of feedback I'm getting. Now, so far, I've got 48% can compute an average, 45% make a simple comparison, 
57 percent and it's going up the line here now these numbers are not adding up to a hundred percent so I'm not exactly sure what that means but I'm going to go ahead and close this as I said it was an experiment and I'll have to circle back and try to figure out why the percentages are not not adding up so let me share this with you and so here's here's what the results were and so at least it gives us some idea certainly the last level of mixture design is got the least percentage, which is what I would expect. And then uh, perhaps there's kind of a happy medium in the middle at two-level factorial design. Okay, so now what I'll do is hide that, and then we'll go back to our presentation. But uh, meanwhile, I'm just going to make a note about this poll, the curious uh, addition here, uh, why adding up to greater than 100%. So I have a little statistical follow-up to do on that. All right, so let's continue on then with our presentation. And I want to talk about uh, various thorny issues, stuff that can happen. Uh, the word stuff is kind of an acronym. Some people use a four-level letter word that says, you know, S blank, blank, blank happens. Uh, but that's up to you. I'm just going to say stuff. Okay, so what kind of stuff can happen? Let's talk about that. Well, uh, basically, I can see two major issues. Uh, in terms of this, the topic of, at hand here, which is how to maintain a reasonable balance between two types of errors. And one thorny issue is that you focus only on data that vary due to common causes, thus introducing bias. This is a very bad thing. You talk about four-letter dirty words in statistics. It would be B-I-A-S, bias. A um, couple of examples here uh, on the plus side versus the minus side. On the plus side, was uh, the findings by Stanley and Pons out of uh, Utah back, oh, 15 years ago, I think, that they seem to be seeing uh, examples of cold fusion. But it turned out that they were getting uh, uh, leakage of heat, and they were keeping only the high results and then biasing their answer that there was cold fusion when there really wasn't. It could not be reproduced. So that's not good. Another example strikes closer to home. Uh, the source of it is my dad, James J. Anderson. Uh, he tells me the story about his work as a wastewater treatment engineer or sanitary engineer. He's actually a master's in civil engineering. And uh, he went to work at this wastewater treatment plant in the St. Paul, Minneapolis area where Sandy's is located. And the name of the treatment plant is called Pig's Eye, which is kind of interesting. The reason it's called Pig's Eye is because a Frenchman by the name of Perrot who had a bad eye, and hence was called pig's eye, settled into this area, which is not a very attractive part of the cities along the river, and that became the site of the treatment plant subsequently. Now, back in the early 60s, uh, my dad uh, started working, and he was uh, surprised to see that they were bringing in truckloads of a flocculant uh, into the plant, <clears throat> and he didn't really think it was doing any good, but when he went back to the records, he found that uh, there was systematic elimination by the chief engineer back in the 1930s of any result that showed a high level of pollution. He had some reason why it should be discounted. So he was selectively uh, eliminating what he felt were high results and keeping only the low results. And so this naturally resulted in a recommendation that this flocculant should be added. So my dad had to come up with some way of, you know, of proving pretty much we had a shadow of a doubt that this wasn't the case. So he asked around and said, well, who would be good at statistics that could help me with this? And lo and behold, he got the recommendation to talk to this fellow over here on the left-hand side. His name is George Box. And you may have heard of him. He's the inventor of response surface methods. Uh, he carried the torch forward for Ronald Fisher, who developed DOE as a whole, statistics uh, in general, and uh, invented the response surface methods back in 1951. And luckily for us here in the States, uh, he came and became a professor at University of Wisconsin in Madison, which is really not too far from Minneapolis and St. Paul. So uh, my dad got connected up with George Box, and George Box said, well, why don't you set up a two-level factorial design, and one of the factors will be the category uh, factor of whether you put flocculant in or not, and then you can put a number of other factors in. And so he did, did that, and uh, as a result of this two-level factorial experiment, he was able to show that there was no significant improvement to put the flocculant in, and so that uh, accomplished his mission. 
So I think that's kind of a neat story because it, it just shows the widespread influence of George Box and the capability of two-level factorial design to produce an unbiased experiment. Now another type of error that we could get into, uh, which is akin to type 1 and type 2 errors for errors of uh, detection and errors of power, uh, is overlooking true uh, special cause changes or true outliers, uh, thus obscuring the real effects. I have a case later that uh, talks about that, drawing false conclusions, or losing a chance in the future to prevent failure. And one of the uh, key examples here is the ozone hole, which is pictured uh, on the left-hand side here. Um, when the first measurements were taken, the drop in ozone levels in the stratosphere were so dramatic that at first the scientists thought their instrument were, were faulty, and they actually deleted those, those results, thinking that they were outliers. But they were actually true responses, and they indicated you know, a fairly alarming change in our atmosphere uh, due, in, due, due to the floral carbons and things like that. Um, another example of uh, an outlier that uh, can be of interest is here in St. Paul, Minnesota, a guy by the name of Art Fry, who was trying to develop an adhesive, and he was failing in, in that mission, but he discovered that this adhesive that was not working really well could make a very nice sticky note, and so we had this eureka moment, and they developed the 3M post-it notes as a result. So that's an example where um, if they had not been on the a ball and watching for this unusual behavior and being creative and, and re, uh, responding to it, they would never have invented this, this product. I also heard recently uh, from a guy by the name of Gore who invented Gore-Tec, and he's a graduate of University of Minnesota, my uh, school, uh, chemical engineering, and he told a story just last week that uh, he was trying to make um, some sort of duct tape, and he realized that this tape uh, had water repellent features and it was very stretchy and then he came to the conclusion that this would make a very good material for jackets and shoes and things like that and of course you probably know the rest of the story about Gore-Tex, a very very successful product that developed sort of as a, a mistake. So those are two interesting stories that strike home here in St. Paul, Minneapolis. Okay now I'm going to go back to my attendee list and just to make sure that we're still on board here would you again press that uh, raise hand feature on your uh, uh, go to webinar? Great. Okay. Very good. Very good. Okay. Thank you. And again, hopefully that you're entering in um, questions for Brooks if you have something very immediate. Otherwise, uh, go to the stat help at stadies.com or email mark at stadies.com with your questions and we'll follow up after the presentation. Okay. Uh, so continuing on then. Uh, about stuff happens. Well, there's all sorts of things that can happen. Uh, being from the cold, frozen north here in Minnesota in the central part of North America, uh, I've naturally developed kind of a skeptical attitude about things. And uh, basically, my approach is expect the worst, but hope for the best. Expect the worst, but hope for the best. Um, so in that regard, then I'm sort of prepared for, for things that happen. But uh, one of the more common problems that you'll find in doing design experiments is simply mistyping. Uh, and this was a deliberate error that I put in here. Uh, so don't email me or write uh, that I've got a typo because I did that on purpose just to be funny. But uh, seriously, it's very easy to miss a decimal point, to miss a number. So my suggestion is that you always type the data from the top, but then prove it from the bottom. I found this to be very effective and if I'm extremely diligent about uh, transcribing numbers into uh, uh, the software and because uh, I've, I've been burnt uh, more than a few times by making a dumb typographical error. Uh, so, so that's one of the things that's very, very common. Uh, beyond that, um, certainly when you're doing experimentation, it's not unusual to, to see breakdowns in equipment. Uh, mistakes by operators. Um, this picture here was defending champion Tony Stewart triggering a crash at the Talladega Super Speedway that collected 10 of the 12 title contenders in the October 12 NASCAR race. So this fellow Tony Stewart, Stewart was not a very popular uh, driver uh, after this event. Uh, but you know, that can happen. Stuff can happen. Um, I have an example I can give you from my own experience 
when I worked across the street from where Sandy's is now located at General Mills Chemical Research Center, uh, a chemist by the name of Bill that I was working with on design experiments uh, sent me some data and I did some analysis of it and one result was very, very bad. And so I said, Bill, what happened? He said, well, we had a fire alarm and uh, I was startled and knocked the beaker out of the floor. An hour later, I came back and the product was viscous enough. I was able to collect it, put it back in the uh, beaker and resume the reaction. So I said, well, okay, Bill, that, that I think we're going to treat as an outlier and we're going to remove that data point or ignore it for the analysis. So that would be a case of a special cause. Sampling is another thing that can be very uh, tricky and trying to make sure that you get a representative sample. That can be a problem. Bad measurements. Um, it could be just that the capability is, is poor or it could be some mistake that was made in the measurement itself. And then unknown lurking variables that appear only intermittently. Uh, there's a famous case in Krepno, uh, uh, Krepno Traeger, uh, Kepner Trago uh, problem solving that I had in my MBA school where uh, they kept getting uh, dirt in the uh, filaments of fabric and they couldn't figure out where it was coming from until they discovered that once a day a train came by and they had left the window open to cool off the factory and the train was putting out smoke and it was getting into the plastic. So those were unknown lurking variables that appeared only intermittently but eventually by using control training capability they were able to pin it down. So you can consider, has any of this stuff happened to you? And maybe next time I might set up a poll and get some input for, from people. But if you have any great stories, you know, email me uh, some of the stuff that's happened and I can add it to the list. Here's one that I, I found in my files when I was going through the other day. Uh, it went back a number of years, but uh, it's one of the things here in Minnesota we always like to say when it's really bad weather or whatever. It could be worse. That's our one of our famous sayings. And this was in a situation where you uh, would say it could be worse. Mark, good afternoon. I appreciate you calling me and discussing the results. We had an accident in the lab, and one of the techs caught fire. So I think subsequently I learned that the, the technician was OK, but um, uh, that's probably one of the worst things I've heard You know, as to why the experiment didn't work out. Okay, so uh, we're talking about two types of error, and let's be positive here that stuff does not always happen. Um, there are a, a, a kind of a little truth test that we can set up here. Um, what you say is, yes, there is an outlier, and the truth is that there is an outlier statistically, and there's a special cause behind it. So then you would be correct in uh, your assessment. Another positive would be you say there aren't any outliers and the truth is no there aren't any. So that would be a quadrant that is correct. But my focus is on these two uh, parts that are not giving us the answer that we should be getting. One is that we say that there is an outlier when there really isn't. And so that is an example of a false positive outcome. And another a way of saying that is called a type 1 error. Another uh, way that we could be off is we could say, no, there is no outlier, when the truth is there really is an outlier, and that would be uh, what's called a type 2 error, a false negative, and that's an error of having low power and missing a real effect. So there's basically these two uh, mistakes that can be made, and there's really no way around it. But let's look at two, let's look at two case studies that illustrate these errors, and maybe we can get some ideas on how to reduce the chances of either type 1 or type 2 error. So uh, now let's talk about uh, case study number one, which is a secret to long life. And uh, this is also called the bearing case, as you'll see in a moment why. Okay, so here is the bearing that we're going to talk about. It's a, a picture um, that kind of represents some of the variables we can study. But one of the key variables is actually the radius of the bearing itself to the cage around the bearing. And this is called osculation. So it's the uh, how snug that, that bearing is to the cage. So that was one of the factors that, that was studied. Now giving some background to this story, this goes back to George Box and a student of his by the name of Christopher Hellstrand that came to Wisconsin 
and he came from a company called SKF in, in Sweden, and they were having problems uh, with competition from the Japanese back in the late 1970s, and they decided that they better do some experiments. Now, prior to uh, Hellstrand coming and learning about design experiments from George Box, they were doing what was called one-factor-at-a-time experimentation, one-factor-at-a-time, OFAT type of experimentation, and this is kind of a traditional scientific method. Uh, it turned out that they were running on this accelerated test about 17 hours in the bearing life, and their goal was to double the bearing life. So they tried changing the oscillation, and they got some increase, but it wasn't enough. They then changed the heat treatment on the bearing, and they got an increase, but it wasn't doubling the life, so that wasn't really what they were trying for. And finally, they changed the cage from a metal to a plastic, which really would have been a cost reduction. They didn't expect that that would really help. If anything, it would hurt. It did actually help a little bit, maybe, but not enough to double the life. So now, uh, Hellstrand came in. He had learned from George Box a technique called two-level design. And this two-level design is represented by the cube that we show here. Now, this cube represents two levels with three factors, which we represent as number two to the power of three. So one way of representing this is two to the power of three, and it's called a full two-level factorial design. If we do the math on this, two times two times two is equal to eight combinations. And you can see the eight combinations here. Well, obviously, there's a big breakthrough up here in this corner. And up here in this corner, you're seeing an impact of both oscillation and heat treatment which is actually an interaction that's synergistic. It's a positive interaction, and we represent that with the letter A, B. So the interaction is the key. And this is the beauty of doing two-level design, is detecting potential interactions like this that can create a breakthrough. Well, what's interesting about this case study is that it actually exhibits potentially an outlier that may cause you to throw the whole data set out from the very beginning. And here we have uh, uh, the first uh, problem that a person might see if they're very savvy on two-level factorial design. But you have to know something about the half-normal plot of effects. In my little survey that I did, it seemed like quite a number of you did click the two-level factorial design, so hopefully you've seen this. But just a quick idea of how this works is we're plotting the absolute value of the effect on the bottom here. So keeping our eyes on the prize, what we're looking for are effects that fall to the right. What's interesting about this plot is it's got a specialized y-axis that's actually scaled according to the c-table, which is taking the absolute value of it. So if you can imagine a normal plot coming up like this, but now it's going to be folded over so that um, what we have really is something like this that indicates that we've got a trivial many effects near the zero level and these over here, as I said, keeping the eyes on the prize are what are called the vital few. And typically about 20% of main effects and two-factor interactions might emerge as being active or significant. Now, what's wrong with this picture, if you're familiar with half-normal plot, is normally these effects should come all the way down to the zero level. But there's a gap in here. So that indicates an abnormality. And so that would be the first thing I would notice as an expert on half-normal plots. But then things really began to go south when we look at the uh, externally studentized residuals plot, which takes each point out of the data set and refits it according to the model that you've set up, which is A, B, and A, B. Um, and then uh, it measures how many standard deviations off each point is from where you expected it to be. And we end up with these two points that are outside of the red lines, which indicate potential special cause. And one should know it, those are our two best results. So for some reason, this 85 is lower than what we would have expected, and the 128 is higher. And so one approach would be just simply to delete these data points. But if we do that, <laughs> we're losing all the advantage. So really, we best check diagnostics first before we start deleting out the data. That's the first lesson that I want to present. So we look at the full normal plot of residuals. This is this uh, another uh, cousin of the half normal plot, but we're going all the way negative and positive. We're taking the residuals and we're scaling them uh, according to the studentization, but the raw residuals would, would show the same pattern. 
Um, I can show you that in just a moment. Um, but which, what we're looking for on this plot of normal probability for the residuals is what's called a, uh, a, a pencil test. And, uh, and basically, we want to see a straight line of points here. But instead, we're seeing this pronounced S-shaped type curve, which is not, not a normal shape. The other thing that we would check would be the predicted versus uh, uh, residuals plot. And for that, we're hoping to see a scatter up and down. But what we're seeing here instead is a pronounced megaphone pattern. So what's going on here is that at the very low levels of life of the bearing, the variation around those levels is very small. But at the high level of bearing life, there's a very large variation. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense because if you're only running at 17 or 19 or 26 or 25, you're not going to get a whole lot of plus or minus on the bearing life. Which you're running up over 100, you know, that variation is probably going to increase quite a bit. So this actually is a normal, natural thing. And in fact, it turns out that there's a plot that George Box invented. I told you George Box was a smart guy. It's called the Box-Cox plot that can tell us something here. What Box and his collaborator Cox came up with was a way to uh, lay out a plot of residuals as a function of the power that you take the response to. And so the response we label Y, if we take it to the power of three and refit the data, we would get you know, a pretty poor result. We could take all the responses to the power of two and refit it, but it wouldn't be that great. On the other side of the uh, number line here, we could take the response to the minus three, response to the minus two. We could take the inverse of it. And then uh, there's a couple of interesting uh, situations here on this power axis. One is if we take all the responses to the power of one, then that's just basically no transformation. And that's currently where we're located. But then if we take all the responses to the power of zero, that would be a bad idea because it would all turn out to, to be one. But this zero point actually is re uh, representing a log transformation. And actually the log transformation is very naturally uh, a good way of going. Either uh, natural log or the base 10 can be equally effective. Now uh, one more thing that Box and Cox did which is really wonderful is they said uh, not only can we minimize the residuals by taking a certain power, but let's keep in mind that statistics means never having to say you're certain. And we should always give an interval around a point estimate so this red line here represents a 95% confidence interval on where they think that minimum actually could be. So what we're going to do is we're going to not get real exact on the power here, but just say, why don't we just take a log that would get us in this red zone here, and we would move from out of the zone into the zone by changing from no transformation to a log transformation. So now we do the log transformation, and I'll give you a, a demo of this using uh, DOE tool in just a moment. But after the log transformation, we see much improved results in terms of the nice lineup on the half normal plot. Uh, see how it's going right down to the zero point, and then there's a gap, and these are the significant effects. And then uh, for the residual plot, it's very nicely lined up. We could put a pencil on that and cover up those points, which is a good uh, semi-quantitative way of saying that the residuals are normal. And then on the residual versus predicted, you know, after you do the transformation of the responses to the log, you get a nice scatter up and down from left to right. And this is a pattern that we're looking for. So this represents uh, a situation where the assumptions have been satisfied, and yet we're able to still keep these uh, factors of not only A and B, but also the AB interaction. We didn't have to throw those out. And so no outliers. And so this is just kind of the way nature sometimes goes, um, that results will vary by a broad, broad range. And for example, exponential growth of biological organisms, that type of thing, would be where the law of transformation would naturally come into play. So that pretty much tells the story. And now what I'd like to do is uh, show you the stunning results here of this variant case. It's a very good example of how two-level design saves the day over the one-factor-at-a-time approach. Here is the actual interaction of oscillation going from low to high. And uh, if you keep the heat at the low level, increasing the oscillation doesn't change your response. But when you go to the high heat level, you get this huge increase. 
Now, one of the interesting aspects of doing the transformation is when you look at the plus or minus least significant difference bar, it reflects the fact that at the high level of the bearing life, of course, there will be more variation. And so actually this variation encompasses this 85 to 128. That's not really out of the range of what you would expect for individual results. So this is a very, very uh, cool example. And um, the rest of the story is that not only did they increase the bearing life uh, tremendously, in fact, um, according to this article in the year 2000, they improved their bearing life from 41 million re re revolutions on average to 400 million, which was nearly a tenfold improvement. But they also learned that they could switch from the metal to the plastic, which you can see here, and that saved a lot of money. So they were able to make cheaper bearings that lasted longer and defeat the Japanese uh, that were trying to compete with them back in the 70s. So that's a, a very interesting story. Now what I'm going to do is just run through this case study one more time using a tool called Design Expert Software, which is published by Statis. Um, the same sort of uh, tools I'll show here are available in other packages or general stat packages will use kind of similar techniques, although I think uh, what Statis does by focusing on DOE alone is we're able to use more specialized types of things like the half-normal plot uh, than other packages can provide. So let me show you that. I'm going to toggle over to Design Expert. <clears throat> and here is a recipe sheet. I'm going to show you how this design is built using Design Expert. Uh, this is the design builder for two-level factorial design. Across the top, you have the number of factors uh, re represented by the columns. And along the left-hand side, you've got runs, which are powers of two. And this white diagonal represents full factorial designs. Now, it turns out I'm not going to get into in this presentation that as you get to five or more factors, it becomes expeditious to uh, use what's called a fractional factorial. And this would have been one that I would have used quite a bit as a chemical process development engineer, where I would have had five factors like time, temperature, pressure, concentration, agitation rate, things like that. And I would have done the half fraction instead of all 32 runs. Uh, and you can see with the color coding that this is a green go-ahead type design. And there's other types of designs that are good for screening, which are represented with the yellow squares. And then the red ones are low resolution, but those might be good for ruggedness testing. Uh, ASTM 1169, for example, calls for uh, these resolution three designs where you're simply trying to see whether the process will continue to operate. It's kind of a go-no-go -no -go type test. But here we're going with a really, really simple experiment with three factors, just all the possible combinations, which is eight runs. This is a fairly small design with only four at the low level and four at the high. So for it to be effective, we're going to have to have at least two or three standard deviations in terms of the effects, which we do. So I'm going to say yes here. Here are the names of the factors. We could put units of measure. Uh, I've entered these in as categoric factors because Hellstrand, when he published this, disguised what the actual levels were. But normally I would have put numeric factors with the low and high levels in here but this is all that we got uh, due to the confidentiality of it. And then um, the names of the responses. Now, it turns out that we were trying to see a doubling of life from 17. So we're not really interested in any effect that's less than 17. The standard deviation of this bearing life test runs about 8, which gives us a 17 divided by 8, or 2.125 signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, our program can then determine the power of this experiment. And you'll see that then the eight runs that we're uh, providing is really not enough to be able to see a 17-hour difference. It would have to be a larger difference to be detected by eight runs. But that's what they did. And, of course, we know now that they got a lot more than 17 hours of bearing life improvement. And that's why the uh, experiment produced a significant outcome. So I would normally, if I was going through this process, I pr probably would have recommended that they run 16 runs. Um, let's just take a quick look and see if we were to uh, redo this and uh, do a complete replicate of it would be one approach. Or I probably would try to think of one more factor. I, I actually like that better uh, because you could get one more factor in and do 16 runs. And let's see what the power of that is. 
See, that would have been enough power to see even a 17-hour difference. So that's, uh, that's how I would go about uh, sizing this experiment. Now let's take a look at the results of this. And we can see the process of analyzing where we start off with no transformation. And we see this gap in the uh, bottom part of the graph that is not quite right. But we go ahead and pick the biggest effect starting from the biggest one and working our way down. And when the line jumps up, that's usually where we stop. And these are the trivial many here that haven't been picked. Now there is another way of looking at this called a Pareto chart that gives you a better visual of how these three effects really stand out from the four trivial many at the bottom. And then of course we're going to look up our p-values and make sure that we've got p-values less than 0.05. And then the diagnostics. And this is where things begin to look uh, really bad in terms of this S-shaped curve the megaphone pattern on the residual versus predicted, and the real tell is in the box Cox plot, and it tells us that we should go to a log. So hopefully that's a process you go through and you don't jump right to the influence side and begin to flag out points and start you know, thinking about deleting these points because these are points that are actually some of the best results that we can get. So we don't really want to eliminate these, these high level results. So box Cox says use a log, so I would do a box of Cox C, and we could take a natural or base 10. I'm going to take a base 10. And now notice how the effects at the near zero level line up a lot better. We get a much clearer separation of effects, according to the Pareto chart. Better p-values. We get uh, more normal diagnostics on the normal plot and the residual versus predicted. And in the box Cox, we're now in the zone. Some people look at this and say, well, we took a log, and now Box Cox says take a log again. So should we take a log on top of the log? And I always say, no, one log is enough. Um, you don't have to take another log after this. And then the real cool part is that these two that were out of the boundaries are now in the boundaries. They can be explained in the log scale very easily. And then the final result of the uh, interaction is shown here. Okay, well that uh, runs through a lot of different aspects of two-level factorial design in the context of uh, watching out for outliers and using transformations to take what looked like an outlier and explain it as part of the model. Um, and so thus avoiding uh, an error that we would have made if we would have deleted those, those, out, those uh, outliers. Okay, Brooks is, is here and he's got a, a question. I figured out how to do the floor. Okay. All right. I want to try that again. Oh, do another I made poll? A new one. You did a new poll. Maybe okay. Only answer one. Okay, Brooks has done a new poll here. So we're going to do an on the fly experiment here. And I'm going to the polls here. And now I'm going to go to um, the a new one that he's created, which again says, What is your highest level of DOE well, ability? And I'm going to launch this. And okay, now let's try this poll again. Please enter in again uh, what your level is. And you may remember from the last time what your answer was and try to give the same answer. And it looks like Brooks has discovered a way to keep the percentages to 100. Last time they could check all that apply. Ah, OK. OK. So thank you, everybody, for helping us uh, do a little trial and error experimentation here. And so next time around, we'll do a little bit better. Uh, so what I'm going to do then is go ahead and close this poll so you can see the results of it. And let me take a look at what you're looking at here as well. And uh, okay, here I got to press share. Okay, here we go. Sharing poll results. Okay, now it should be showing up on your screen. And now we see, you know, a better uh, histogram of where people are at. And as I would have expected, it looks like the biggest bar is coming out kind of in the middle of the range of the different levels that I was looking for. So that. Uh, provides a little sanity here to uh, statistics uh, that, that we're adding up to more than 100%. All right, so what I'm going to do then is close out this poll. I'll hide it, and we'll go back to our presentation. And I can tell from your response to the poll that you're still there and you're still with me, so I do appreciate getting that feedback. All right, now let's move on, and we'll talk about one more case, which represents the other type of error that I wanted to discuss, and that is, uh, where uh, 
we are overlooking a true outlier that actually is sabotaging our results. So the first case, the secret to long life burying case, was one where there wasn't an outlier, but that we thought there was. This case is one where there is an outlier, but we don't realize that it's there. This is another uh, true story. It's one that uh, I can relate uh, myself in that uh, a guy by the name of Dave DeVoe from a company called Tool Products here in Minneapolis took a, our class on Experiment Design Made Easy and <clears throat> subsequently uh, I was working one day and I felt this presence at my back and I turned around and Dave had actually come into the office and come right over to my desk and he was sort of standing behind me and giving me a frowny face and I said, Dave, uh, it's good to see you. I hope everything's going well. But Dave had this frowny face uh, on and I said, is there a problem? And he said, yes. He said, we went back to uh, our factory after I took this class. I ran a two-level design with four factors represented by two to the power of four. It's a full factorial, so there's 16 runs. And you can see the layout here in standard order that goes minus, plus, minus, plus, all the way down. Two minuses and two pluses. And then four minuses and four pluses. And then, uh, hold on here. We've got eight minuses and eight pluses, but wait a minute, there's one, two, three, four, oops, there's a fifth factor here. So actually this is a two to the five minus one. And so this is a, a design that I would recommend. It was one of the green squares that I showed you with five factors and 16 runs. So it turns out then E is equal to actually the combination of A times B times C times D uh, in terms of the minus plus. But that's a, a detail on how these designs are put together. Fisher figured this out, and uh, it's a good, good structure. So now let's put our eyes on the prize here. What Dave was trying to do was reduce the fraction defect in this uh, molding process, <clears throat> and they were running at about 25%. The only good thing was that they could remelt the aluminum and recast it, but you can imagine that this was producing a big reduction in their throughput. So the fraction defect is uh, the uh, response, and this is on a zero to one scale. It actually works pretty well if you have enough defect that you have more than zero for every cell. And actually the range of, of defect here is quite broad, going from what, about uh, 0.1 or 0.06, all the way up to 100% defect. So here was a condition where it all was bad, and they just had to remelt everything. But then some of the conditions are good, so I would have thought Dave would have been happy, but I'll tell you why he wasn't. The reason he wasn't happy is that on our normal plot of effects, or half normal plot, none of the effects really stood out. And so he said he wanted his money back from the class, and he wanted the uh, refund on the software. And I said, Dave, I said, you know, you're the one that decides what factors to study, what responses to measure. Um, it's your call all the way down the line. You're an engineer. Uh, I'm not going to give you your money back, but hold on a second. Maybe we can do something here. Because one of the things is that if you really think there's an effect, and we can see the broad range here, and if it doesn't show that there's much of an effect on the half normal plot, you should at least try to pick the top effect, maybe the first couple effects at the top, and check and see if there's an outlier, and or maybe there could be uh, a transformation that could, could help. Now, the first thing is that with the uh, fraction defect as a response, it turns out that uh, when you get near to 100, like this one here, and get near to zero, like this one here, um, you can get some interesting problems with trying to maintain constant variance, which is more or less overcome by taking this special transform that I warned you about earlier called an arc sine square root. And so whenever you have binomial data like this, I would recommend trying this arc sine square root. So uh, we did that, but still uh, there wasn't much of a uh, gap here on the effects, but I said, let's go ahead and pick, you know, at least the biggest effect, which was D, and let's see what the next one is. It was BD, and then the third one was B. I said, okay, that's actually a nice little family of effects. Maybe we can run with that and see what we can find out, because possibly there's an outlier, and I've seen this happen quite often where people mistype data or there's a machine breakdown or operator error, uh, the types of things I talked about earlier, 
that cause a result that just doesn't uh, hold up with all the rest of them. And there's a special cause, and that sabotages the entire experiment. So here's uh, what happened when we went ahead and picked those three effects. Well, we saw that there was one point that didn't really fit with the rest. And you can see it on this externally studentized residual plot. You can see it's way, way off. Uh, it's six standard deviations lower than we should have expected based on the rest of the data points. So I said, Dave, get on the phone and talk to your people and find out what happened. So he did. I was standing right there. And so he gets on the line with the foreman, and I hear him talking to the fellow, and it turns out that they forgot to make one of the runs. During the week, they ran all 15, but they didn't run run number one. I don't know how that happened, but they, they just sort of jumped right into run number two and went all the way through to run number 16, and then they went, oops. So Monday morning, they uh, conspired to come in early, start up the foundry, and sneak in this one run before Dave showed up. And of course, during the startup phase of the foundry, that result was very poor. So that was what we call a special cause. So the diagnostic plots identified standard order number one, uh, as it turns out, um, was a discrepant outcome. And this is the uh, rest of the story here in terms of how the foreman, you know, try to make up for it. So what do we do next? Well, uh, actually, it's pretty simple. Let's ignore that run and reanalyze the data and see if things will clear, clear up a bit. Wow. Okay, so here we have ignored that one run that was done at a different time frame while the foundry wasn't really operating at its normal conditions. And look at the clarity now of the three uh, vital few effects and the other trivial many effects. It's very, very clear that uh, something has happened here that wasn't just caused by chance. Now, by eliminating this one point, it does cause a, a little bit of information loss, but it's not really serious in this case. Um, and as a general rule, I might suggest that if you could lose up to about 10% of your data, and if you've uh, taken the approach of one and doubt, build it stout, and built up a, a decent design, you could probably get by with the remaining data and still get a good outcome. At least we did here. So here is the, the interaction that was not obvious, but now it is. And it has to do with these uh, factors of what I call trip, going from low to high, and fast shot. And this is kind of a typical problem of trying to decipher what's going on if you're doing only one factor at a time when there's actually factors that are interacting with each other because when the fast shot is at the high level, changing the trip has no significant uh, outcome. You can see the overlapping LSD bars on either side. But when the tr uh, fast shot is at the low level, then it pays to increase the trip to try to get those defects you know, back down again. And so a combination of these factors and some other things, was able, they were able to get the defects down dramatically. So now uh, what I'll do is I'll show you uh, the results using the tool of Design Expert. So back to Design Expert, I'm going to close out the file that I have here. And let me open up um, the uh, metal mold case. Now notice that I, at the present, have the uh, uh, outlier ignored, what I'm going to do is set the row status of this back to normal so that we can bring it back into the analysis and I can show you what happened. So when Dave showed up and he was standing behind me and kind of giving me the frowny face, here's what we were looking at. Um, basically no significant outcome, you know, is emerging on this half normal plot. So the first thing I said is, well, let's use the arc sine square root which is good for binomial responses that are going between 0 and 1, and see if that helps. Uh, that didn't really help that much. So I said, well, what's the biggest effect? And it was D. And then I moved back down and said, what's the next biggest effect, BD? And I did one more check and said, well, this might be a good little family of effects to try to see if there's an outlier. And sure enough, here's the one that pops out. And if you look at the influence plot, you can see how low it is. So going back to that, we can see that it is this first one in standard order. And that's where we're going to ignore this, reanalyze in the arc sine square root. And 
Uh, because of the one missing point, it's unraveled the orthogonality of the data set. Uh, that's okay. But here we see that there's three effects now that really pop out. And our Pareto chart, you know, illustrates how significant those three effects are. And the p-values also, uh, also show this. And you can see the p-values are very good. And then diagnostically, uh, we're getting, you know, pretty reasonable outcome enough that we don't have any reason not to press ahead with the final results, which are shown here. And so this is the interaction. And you can see the twisting that this causes in the planar surface of, of defects. And of course, what we want is to get down at these lower levels of, of defects uh, down here and see how low we can get it. So this was a pretty dramatic case because uh, the defects were running up at such a high level. Okay, Brooks has got a couple of questions here at this point. Okay, the LSD bars, let's take a look at that. There's a question about that. If I look at the interaction plot, uh, for example, uh, what we're looking at is from left to right on the red line, and we can see that uh, at this uh, high level of D, which is the, the fast shot, um, going from the left side to the right side, which is changing the trip from low to high, the LSD bars overlap. So you would say there is no significant difference going from left to right. But once we go to the uh, black level of the fast shot, which is a low level, then there's a, clearly a gap between the LSD bars at the top point and the bottom point. So the difference between these two black squares is significant at the 95% confidence level, whereas for these red triangles, it's not significant. So the LSD bars uh, can be used from left to right. You can also look from bottom to top. So for example, we could spin this a little different way and we could say, if we're running the trip at 390, is there a difference between the fast shot? And the answer, of course, is yes, because there's no overlap between these two LSD bars. Now going to the right side of the graph, we could ask if we set the trip at 410, is there any significant difference on the fast shot? And the answer would be no, because these bars overlap. And then um, another question was for this current example, after the outlier was identified, was the arc sine square root still necessary? Um, Perhaps not. Um, the only way that I could really test that is by going back and trying without a transformation. I'm guessing that this will work because it's such a uh, dramatic effect. And yes, so even without the arc sine square root, um, we're able to get a very uh, dramatic separation of the three factors of BD and BD. And I wouldn't really have a problem with uh, going without a transformation, just to keep it simple statistically, the KISS principle. Um, as George Box said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So along those lines, we would get a result that would still get, get us to where we want. But notice that without the arc sine square root, that these LSD bars don't really show the fact that you're going to get less variation as you get near to the zero level and as you get up at the that level of one. And it's actually showing a 120% defect rate on the bar here. So I think that although this would work, I think the arc sine square root would give you more uh, uh, veracity, more credibility uh, if you're going to present the results. So I'm going to go back and redo the arc sine square root. I'm lassoing these defects. And notice that if we go back to the uh, interaction graph, that uh, we're getting a little better picture of the fact that there's a boundary at one on the on the fraction defect and at zero at the bottom, and these LSD bars will change uh, as you get closer to the top and to the bottom. So I think that uh, I would say that the arc sine square root is not necessary, but it is helpful even in this case. So thank you for those questions. That's very helpful, and keep those questions coming either to Brooks, and he will eventually uh, follow up with every one of them and or sending the email questions. So this ended up being a very uh, successful story um, because uh, Dave was happy. Uh, he didn't ask for his money back from the class. He didn't try to return his software. He realized that you have to be careful in looking over the results that stuff can happen. And by at least trying, uh, by picking a few effects, 
and checking the diagnostics, you're able to see uh, when there really is an outlier that, that can be ignored. So let me conclude my presentation now. We're coming up on the hour, and I don't want to go past that. So my conclusions are that an outlier is a response from an experiment that does not fit the proposed model. But before jumping to any conclusions, consider these possibilities. Uh, the model may be faulty, not the data. And that is exemplified by the bearing case. Um, the bearing case in the original metric seemed to indicate that there were two results that were off. But after we realized from looking at the bad patterns on the diagnostic plots, and the tell was a box cox in particular, we realized that the log scale was better. And in the log scale, we were able to fit the data and explain you know, what was going on and get a much better handle on LSD bars and things like that. So log is actually a very, very common transformation. Anytime you have a response that varies by more than threefold, and certainly if it's more than tenfold, I would be watching for taking a log. Another transformation that can be helpful is a, a contractive as well as a log is a square root transformation. This is very good for counts of things like imperfections on a film. Um, again, the box cox should give you a tell on that. Another one the box cox might tell you is the inverse, uh, which is y to the minus 1. These are very good for rates. For example, when you're looking at the performance of your engine, instead of doing miles per gallon, if you do the inverse and do gallons per mile, or even better yet, gallons per 10,000 miles, could be a very good metric for uh, getting a more significant outcome and getting a better feel for what's really going on. And then the arc sine square root is one that's uh, particularly good for fraction defects. And there might be other types of transformations that are even more complicated. However, given the complaint I got from the ASQ uh, quality professional, I figured I'd better quit while I was ahead after taking an arc sine and a square root. So I decided I wouldn't really try to pile up any more functions after that. Um, another thing that can happen is that uh, there really is a problem with the data, or at least one of the data points, and there really is an outlier. And that's a situation where we want to be watchful to look for any possible errors in data entry in the measurement or in the conduct of that particular experimental run, which was the case in the metal where the foreman and his crew just forgot to do one of the runs and they came back later and tried to do it. Or the chemist I mentioned, Bill, uh, accidentally knocked the beaker off the table during a fire alarm. And that was another case where there was a special cause. Um, now, one of the interesting things is that possibly you could have an outlier that is due to a special cause, but it's actually a new invention, a new discovery. And those would be the cases where Art Fry discovered post-its and this guy Gore developed Vortex and many other cases like that. So it's really important to be on the lookout for uh, stuff that happens and see if you can get around it uh, in, in one case in terms of transformations or in another case, you know, identifying that there really is a special cause and maybe learning something as a result. But no matter what, you want to avoid this four-letter dirty word in statistics, which is bias. And even uh, rocket scientists like Richard Feynman, who's a famous physicist from Caltech, became uh, knowledgeable about the fact that it's easy to become biased. And he said, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself. And you are the easiest person to fool. So it's very, very easy as you learn more and more about something to start uh, coming to conclusions that are, that are not warranted by the data and making the data you know, conform to your bias. And that's, that's where you really get in trouble like Stanley and Pons did with the cold fusion. All right, well, let me conclude my presentation then just to mention that we do provide training at Stadies. Many of you probably have taken this two-day Experiment Design Made Easy class, which is a good starting point. Um, and then from there, if you want to move up to the higher levels of RSM, we have a class on that. Mixture Design, uh, which would be good for the chemists and formulators, um, is another uh, direction you can go. And even more advanced type of classes like this Advanced Formulations where you can combine mixture and process variables. As I like to say it, you can mix your cake, bake it too, and you could put frosting on the top. So that, that would be a very advanced type of experiment. Uh, we also have a series of specialized two-day classes now, uh, designed experiments for pharma, life sciences, food science, assay optimization, 
Uh, if you're interested in any of these classes, contact Sherry Kruber. Here's her email. And then we have uh, some uh, a free resource here, a free DOE web-based optional that you can get to via this www.stadies.net. Uh, this is overseen by Brooks and Sherry. And then, of course, I mentioned the DOE Simplified is a new uh, offering that's a web-based uh, and it would be a blend of training that's coming from the book, DOE Simplified, that you're going to be reading and then possibly taking advantage of the free uh, launch pad that's uh, set up um, on the web. We have lots of ways that we can boost you up the uh, scale here on your know-how on DOE. Of course, these webinars are given on a regular basis, uh, maybe three, four times a year. Uh, we have lots of publications posted. Take a look at our 3 wstatiescom uh, go to the search button and just type in whatever it is you're looking for and you might be surprised by some of the case studies that we have available. If you're using Stati software, do take advantage of the screen tips button uh, because it provides lots of good information. Like here on the half normal plot, if I press the screen tips, I can even show a little uh, video tip uh, clip that shows you how you start with the biggest effect off to the right and then click your way back. So it kind of illustrates how to make use of this half normal plot, which is a very effective way of uh, selecting effects to start. And so screen tips. We also have, of course, lots of uh, uh, context sensitive help. If you right click on any given number, you're probably going to get some help and then the main help system. We also have a forum. Uh, you can post a question and maybe somebody else will answer it, if not one of our own experts. So that's a free forum that uh, you can go into and post a question. And if you're an expert on DOE, you might go in there and help us provide some answers. Obviously, the email questions are going to be probably the most effective for something specifically that you're interested in. Um, you can send us your design file, and we can give you a second opinion on that. Uh, your results that you get, you can try modeling and see if you can get a second opinion from us on what models you've chosen and things like that. And then if you really get desperate, you can try calling if you're International, uh, we can't arrange for a time to get on Skype or whatever. Um, so that might be the answer at the end. All right, well, I'm reaching the end of my time here. So uh, what I'd like to do is thank all of you for attending this webinar. I really do appreciate the fact that you've uh, been willing to spend uh, upwards of an hour to uh, listen to some of my ideas about DOE. And I do look forward to hearing from you afterwards. Uh, so feel free to uh, email uh, me directly to mark at stadies.com, or if you want a more general uh, audience, uh, go to the stat help uh, at stadies.com, uh, and that's actually the main email I would suggest if you're looking for general help uh, in the future. So uh, best of luck to you for your experimenting, and thanks for listening. Uh, take a look uh, maybe early next week if you're interested in getting the voiceover PowerPoint presentation, and uh, you'll be able to pick that off of this website here. All right, that's it then. Uh, take care now and uh, have a great day wherever you're at. Bye-bye.